Today we continue our series in the book of James, the series entitled Faith in Action, and our passage that we're going to read is, is projected uh, behind me. Uh, as it originally appeared. Uh, and when, when James uh, wrote this epistle, he wrote it in Greek and sent it out to the scattered tribes, and this is what the, the entire epistle looked like, just like this. Uh, and uh, so we can say thank God for translators. Uh, but it is interesting, though, and I, I wanted to project this to show you that when, when we study the Word of God, it's important to understand that we're looking at translations and the reason why a lot of our translations will, will translate certain words differently is because you've got judgment being exercised by the translators on what these different words mean. And we're going to key on two particular words in our passage today, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how the, some of the translators made a judgment call on how those words should be rendered. Uh, but we're going to really look under the hood today in this, in this passage. I've preached on this before, but, but not to this depth. And so we're going to look under the hood this morning at this passage, and now I'll bring up the English version of this. Uh, in James 1, 2-4, uh, James 1... This morning, I pray that I only say what you would have me to say. I pray that we'll be encouraged and motivated to endure the race that you've set before us. It's in Jesus' name we pray this prayer. Amen. The ancient Greeks had a race that they ran on the eve of all the Olympic Games. And I can't pronounce the name of this race, but uh, the, the, the ancient a relay race, and it was a relay race with a torch. And so they would light these torches, and they would give it out to the various teams, and these Greek relay teams then would take the torch and they would run this marathon race. The key is, it wasn't just which team ran the race the fastest. The key was, you had to cross the finish line with your torch still lit. The torch still lit. Now that race became the tradition of the Olympic torch that we know today, uh, where the Olympic torch is carried around. But the key on winning that race was that your, your, your flame, the torch, still had to be lit when you crossed that finish line. And much can be said similarly about the Christian life. It's important that since we are to be the salt and light of the world, that we are to be the light of Christ, it's important that our torch stay lit even as we cross the finish line. Now, in order to withstand the trials and tribulations in life, in order to make sure that our torch is still lit, we go through a lot of training and a lot of development uh, as, as Christians. And the ancient athletes and all the Greek athletes in order to perform those different races, they had to go through a lot of endurance training. They had to go through a lot of strength training. They had to go through a great deal of exercise and fitness and eat right and all that in order to be prepared to run the race effectively. The same is true today. If you've read about what our Olympic athletes, for example, have to go through in order to be ready to go on the Olympics, it's amazing. We're talking about years and years and years and years of preparation just to have like 30 seconds 30 seconds on, on international television to run a, a sprint or something on TV, and yet they practice for years. Uh, from whether they're talking about running or ice skating or hockey or whatever the sport may be, uh, there are these athletes put in a great deal of time and preparation in order to do it. Now, right now, uh, if, you, if you follow the news, you know that Sylvester Stallone won a Golden Globe and has been nominated for an Academy Award for the movie Creed. And he, he, he reprised his famous role, he made famous Rocky Balboa in the movie Creed. I have not yet seen the movie Creed. I plan to rent it when it comes out on Redbox or whatever, so I'll be watching it then. But I can tell you with pride that I have seen every other Rocky movie, okay? <laughs> and uh, I love the Rocky movies, okay? They're just great. And, and if, if I could give you a theme that sort of unites all the Rocky films, and some were certainly better than others, you know, in the Rocky franchise, all are enjoyable, but... Rocky Five was in, but anyway. So, but but all of them, all of them have a theme, and the theme basically is that hard work and endurance pays off in the end. And if you if you watch all the Rocky movies, they all have that 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 theme basically un undergirding it. And that really is the theme of this passage that we're going to look at today. Hard work and endurance pay off in the end, and that's what the Lord is looking for. My wife will always tell me that the Christian life is not a sprint; it is a marathon. 
And, and a lot, lot of times, you know, when we stumble and fall, we'll kick ourselves and get upset because this didn't work out or whatever. And she'll always remind me that life is a marathon. It's a marathon. And when you fall, you get back up and you keep on running. And the Lord has put a race before each and every one of us, a race that we are to run. Hebrews 12 and verse 1 and 2 talks about this, running the race that God has set before us, casting aside every weight. We have a race to run. We have a responsibility before God. We have a calling that God has placed on our life, and it's important that we run that race with diligence and with perseverance. Unfortunately, in the light that we live in this world, it's in a fallen world, and there are fallen people around us, and we ourselves are fallen. And so because of that, the race that we run is going to be challenging, and it's going to be difficult. Life will sometimes be hard, and life will quite often be unfair. And because of that, it's important that we be prepared for the, ad, for the adversity that we will face. Now, I'm not going to break down the Greek in every single one of these words here, but I want to run through this, and, and, and I did study the Greek in all these words here, but I'm going to run through the highlights and kind of show you what James is saying here, and then we're going to really focus on two of the words in this passage. But just to give you a, a, a bird's eye view of what James is talking about, he starts out, my brethren, he's talking again to the scattered tribes, he's talking to to his fellow Jewish believers in Jesus Christ. These are, these are Jews who have accepted Christ as their personal Savior. They accept Jesus as the Messiah, but they've been scattered abroad. And he's writing to them as brethren. He knows these people. He knows them. And he knows a lot of their families, a lot of their children. He's close to a lot of them. And so he's writing as a kindred spirit to them. He writes to them and he says, count it all joy. Now that word count isn't just simply like doing arithmetic, you know, one, two, three, but really, when you look at the Greek behind the word count, it talks about to esteem, to value. It's picture like in the old uh, World War I um, you know, uh, time period when pilots would, would put chalk marks for the planes that they shot down. Basically, they, they were bragging on that. And that's kind of the idea here where he's saying, when you run into a trial and tribulation, chalk it up as a good thing. He's saying, value it, esteem it as a good thing. Remember it as a good thing. When you go through a trial and difficulty, count it joy, and, uh, and that joy is self-explanatory. It means joy, and most of the time that that word is used in the New Testament, it talks about an overflowing joy, a deep joy, a, a strong joy. Uh, count it joy when you fall. Note James says when, doesn't say if. He does not say if you fall. He says when you fall. And if you're here today and you're a brand new Christian and you, and you have not yet fallen into a temptation or difficulty, it's coming, okay? It's coming. Uh, because James is saying, count on it. It's going to happen. And don't notice he also says various trials. It doesn't say when you fall into your trial. It doesn't say that. It's various trials. And that means there's a variety of trials out there. There's a lot of trials that you're going to face, and they come in all shapes and sizes, and you're going to encounter quite a few of them. And it's plural. It's not just one or two here and there. Uh, and, and normally, at least I've been in my experience, that sometimes these trials are not very uh, convenient and they don't space themselves out conveniently. You know, you know they're saying when it rains, it pours. Sometimes a lot of trials will hit you at the same time. It's very rude and inconvenient on their part, but it does happen that way. And so, so James is saying when that happens, when you fall into difficulty, and that word... Esteem and count it as joy. Um, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And we're going to come back to that word patience and, and look at that in more depth. But the their hands, okay? So they enjoy taking tests, right? But when you take a test, that was, that's when you are examined to see whether you actually know the material that has been gone over in school. I mean, you could tell your parents, yeah, I, I know everything. I'm doing good. I got it. But when you have to bring the report card home, that's when, you know, your parents actually see the results of the test.
something similar to that. How many of you have been examined by academic peers when you presented a paper and you've been grilled on that, examined on that, okay? All right, I've been through ordination, which is very similar, where you are actually examined, you are tested to make sure you're ready for the next step and you're grilled on it. And so that's, that's the kind of testing that James has in mind. It's like an interrogation, the challenge here. The testing of your faith uh, produced, the faith is your trust in the Lord, your walk, your beliefs and everything, produces patience. We'll come back to patience. But let patience have its perfect work. The word perfect is basically complete. It's not, don't think of perfect in terms of flawless, but think of perfect in terms of completion. You know, like where, where you are mature, where it's perfect in that sense. That's, that's, the, that's the idea that James is getting at there. So you may be perfect or complete, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. So you will have all of the tools, all the resources, and all the knowledge that God wants to give you. Remember, the task is God has given you a call. He's got a plan and a purpose in your life. And I shouldn't even say the word call in the singular sense. It's really calls in a sense. God has given all of us certain calls in our life. Like right now, I've got a call to be a husband, and I'm called to be a father, and I'm called to be a pastor. And these are specific calls I have in my life. I'm also called to be a friend and hopefully a godly example to the friends in my life. So there are various calls that I have in my life, and the same is true for you. And God has a plan, a purpose for you, and different calls and responsibilities in your life. And you are going to be tested and examined in all those areas so that you may lack nothing, so you have what you need in order to fulfill those calls. Now remember, the context of this entire letter is that James introduces himself as a doulos, a doulos of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. A doulos can be rendered most, of, most efficiently as a slave, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So in other words, James is saying, don't evaluate your trials and tribulations. that sometimes will irritate me is if I'm at home and I've got like an agenda, like I've got like about five things I want to get done. And I will go upstairs and I've got literally in my mind, I've got like five things I want to tick off and do. And then I encounter my lovely wife on the middle level. Okay. When I go upstairs and Jane will sometimes, Oh honey, could you? And what she does is she adds to my agenda. Now, when she adds to my agenda in my mind, I have to recalibrate the priorities in my agenda and incorporate what she's asked me to do. Now, there's often a difference of opinion between us in the priority part. You know, it's like, do I give my priority to Jane, or do I retain my own priority and just kind of get to Jane's stuff when I feel like it, sort of thing. Now, I've been married for 23 years now, and I've learned happy wife, happy life, you know, and so you, you uh, and want to incorporate the Jane's priority. So it irritates me a little bit because, because it's like, ah, I had a plan. And now my plan's been foiled, and I've got to reorient that plan to incorporate Jane's agenda a little bit, okay? Now, that, the reason why I might get irritated is because I'm self-oriented in that perspective. I'm focused on myself and what, what I want. I had a plan. I had an agenda. I had what I want to accomplish. Now, then I've got to incorporate someone else's agenda, and that's kind of a threat. And so you kick into that whole fight or flight response and stuff because it's a threat to what you want, your self-orientation, all right? So likewise, James is saying, if, you if you've got a plan, you've got an agenda for your life, you've got things you want to accomplish, you've got things you want to do in your life, and then trials and tribulations come, you're going to interpret those as a bad thing. You're going to see them as a bad thing because they are inhibiting your plans and your agenda. But if you see yourself as a doulos of the Lord, as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're first and foremost committed to his plans and not your own, then you can do what James is saying here and see it as a good thing when you're being tested and examined. And that's the key. That's why it's so difficult to walk the Christian life sometimes because really what we're trying to do is we're trying to do both. We're trying to serve our own agenda and also occasionally serve the Lord when it's convenient for us. And then when we get hit with difficult times or trials and tribulations, we get angry because that messes up what we've got planned for our life. Now, it's not wrong to have plans, but I'm learning. I haven't learned this. I haven't mastered this, but I'm learning to keep your plans with an open hand before the Lord because God's plans aren't always the same as my plans. 
In fact, quite often they're not the same. And so if you, if you don't have your plans with an open hand before the Lord, if you instead have your plans in a tight fist, then these trials and tribulations are going to really hurt. They're going to hurt a lot because God's got to pry that fist open to get you to submit to him. So make sure that you keep your perspective, your perspective, which is very important, and that you lack nothing. Now I want to dive into two particular words here that are really um, key to understanding this passage. And that first word is trials, what it means by trials. And, and if you uh, look at the Greek word, uh, and the English transliteration of the Greek word is, is the P word there, peresmos. I never can pronounce these very well, so uh, you see it there, the P word, okay? And what that means is a trial, a testing, or a temptation. Now, the King James, the King James classic translation translates this, this word as temptation, diverse temptation. Um, and it is tempting, in a sense. A temptation is basically something that can pull you away from God. And Tim, we think of temptation as, as uh, always, and, and it is always a bad, a bad thing, luring your descent, but we often think of temptation in a very specific and narrow context. You know, like we're tempted to go to an internet site that we shouldn't go to. We're tempted to watch this program we shouldn't watch. We're tempted to hold on to anger or malice toward this person. We're tempted to be rude over here, whatever. You know, we think of it in a very narrow context, but in a broad context, to be tempted uh, is to be lured away from the Lord. You know, the, the, the devil's trying to lure you away. So when you get a bad health diagnosis, that can be a temptation because the temptation is to get your focus off the Lord and get your focus onto your health and get your focus onto worry and things like that. When you get, even when, when Jesus went through the 40 days and 40 nights of fasting, when he, when, when he fasted and Satan came and said, turn these rocks into bread, you know, that doesn't strike us as inherently sinful but what that was is basically Satan was asking Jesus to cheat, basically, and to seize upon his godlike attributes and powers right there instead of being subservient to the cross and subservient. In other words, Jesus' uh, role for the Father was to take upon himself the form and the weaknesses of a man. And that was, that was the Father's agenda for Jesus. And Satan was trying to tempt Jesus off of that agenda. And so instead of, instead of taking orders from the Father, Jesus would then be taking initiative from, from Satan. A very subtle thing. By the way, uh, if you've, I, I love history, as you know. I study history. It's, I'm a history ne- nerd. You know, I just love it. And if you studied about what our prisoners of war went through, the way that the enemy would sometimes try to break prisoners of war is very, very clever. What they would do, instead of just torture, certainly many of them resorted to that, but they would try to get our captives to agree to small little things, just agree, make small little agreements, small little adjustments. You know, if if I can just get this captive to agree to this one little thing, and then this another little thing, and they would just try to get them to answer harmless questions, little things, things that the enemy already knew, uh, but just try to string the person along. And what ends ends up happening is if you can get the person to agree to several little things over time, eventually you can get them to agree to the big things too. If you get them to say yes and to give you harmless, meaningless information, small little bits and pieces of information, eventually you can get them to give you big, juicy bits of information. And that's how the enemy oftentimes was very effective in interrogating our POWs. And of course, we do the same thing with the enemy POWs that we capture. And that's what Satan, Satan plays that game all the time. He tries to lure us away, just get us to compromise a little bit here and a little bit there, just lure us away just a tiny bit here and there, and before we know it, he's got us wrapped around his finger. That's the temptation that James is talking about here. And we get thrown into into difficult times and difficult trials. It's very easy for us to compromise a little bit here and there, to get our minds off Jesus, to take control of our life, to try to get ourselves out of the difficult time, to take our eyes off the Lord and to focus on the storms. That's this kind of temptation that's in play here. But it's also more than just a temptation. It's a testing. It's a trial. It's basically where we get to see how mature in the Lord we really are. I mean, you can tell how um, committed a person is when you start throwing difficult trials and, and stuff at them. When you start hitting them with difficulty, then you can really tell, is this person real or not? You know, uh, this weekend, we, we honor the, uh, the birth of Dr. Martin Luther King and his legacy. 
And one of the things that Dr. King used to express frustration with over and over again, over and over again, is he would express frustration with people who were tacitly on his side, but yet weren't willing or able to endure any difficult time. And yet they, they, they would be quiet and silent. You know, when, when the going gets tough and the going gets rough, they would just be quiet. They would be MIA. They weren't on the scene. And Dr. King would made many quotes along those lines about you can tell how, how, how much resolve a person has by whether they're willing to stand in moments of difficulty, not just moments of ease, moments of difficulty. So can you, as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, can you follow him even in moments of difficulty? That's the examination and the testing that these trials and tribulations are for us. To, to basically say, can you be a Christian? Can you really trust the Lord? Can you follow me even when life is hard, when it's tough, when you're confused, when things are difficult? Can you follow me then? And so that's what we are looking at right now. And then... Uh, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, verse we look at is, and, and I can't pronounce this, but the H word, um, and the word there basically is patience, or uh, it's, tr it's translated patience in the New King James, but it's not patience in the sense that how patient are you when you go through the McDonald's drive through It's not even patient in how, how patient are you when you have to sit in the doctor's office and you wait for your appointment. Um, how patient are you when you have to sit in the emergency room and wait hours and hours and hours, you know, sometimes. You know, that's part of it. But really the patience that we're looking at here is what the old King James translates as long-suffering. Can you suffer a long time? Can you endure? Can you persevere? Can you hang in there and not give up? That is what we're talking about. Again, I think of Rocky, the great theologian, all right? But, but Rocky... In the movie Rocky Balboa, which I believe is Rocky VI, uh, they, they stopped numbering him after a while. I, I got to pause for a second. I remember when Rocky, Rocky was one of the first franchises that used to come out with multiple sequels. You know, it was one of the first that did that. And uh, I remember watching an old Saturday Night Live routine, and they had Rocky 47, and they had, uh, <laughs> they had Mr. T and Rocky in wheelchairs battling, and that was hilarious, but, um, but making fun of it. So the Rocky franchise has been around for a while, certainly. But in Rocky Balboa, the movie, he said this, and that's a great quote. He said, it's not how hard you can hit, it's how hard you can take a hit and keep on going. And that really is what, what we're talking about here with perseverance and endurance. How hard can you take a hit? Can you, can you continue to be strong in your faith even when life is slamming you away? The great heroes of the faith the greatest heroes of the faith, this is their, their, their thing. They were able just to keep on keeping on. And I would say, too, look at Dr. King and all the hits he took in his crusade for civil rights, all the adversity he faced, and yet he was able to stay strong to the end, even giving up his life in the end. The greatest heroes in American history, you look at all of them, and this is the characteristic they had. They hung in there. Sometimes they weren't the most brilliant people in the world. Sometimes they weren't even the most gifted people in the world. They weren't always the smartest people in the world, but they were committed and they hung in there and they never gave up. Every single one of the greatest heroes, and you can just go through them all and you'll find this quality in all of them. Winston Churchill, one of his famous speeches was when he went to a college and gave the commencement address and basically the only thing he said was never, 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 never give up. And he sat down. And that is some great advice. Never give up. Never give up. Are you the kind of person, the kind of fighter, the kind of Christian that will hang in there and even when life isn't pretty, even when it doesn't make sense, you stay firm and you stay committed to your Lord and your Savior. So now we come back to our main text here and looking at all this in, in, in context here, we see that James is calling us to a real and authentic faith where we are willing to hang in there no matter what we are hit with and no matter what happens, to count it all joy, to actually be happy when life gets difficult. And why we get happy? Because then we know a couple things. We know that the Lord is trusting us with this trial. Now, there are some people that will mistakenly say, it's, the, it's a quote that I hear Christians say all the time, and it's, it's really a misnomer. It's really not, it's not accurate. And the quote is this, 
God will never give me more than I can handle. And that's not true. God often has given me a lot more than I can handle. But the key is, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So God will never give me more than he can handle. And if I will lean on his strength, I can handle anything that that this life throws against me. That is the key. That is the key. But if you are trying to face life on your own, you're never going to be able to do it. So you can count it joy. And here's the key, and I I hope I get this across adequately today. The reason why you can count it joy when life throws you difficult times is, is one, because you know the Lord is testing you and that that's a great thing. But two, you know that you're not going through these trials and tribulations alone. You're not going through it by yourself. The Lord is with you. And because the Lord is with you and because of that fact alone, you can rejoice. The Lord has not deserted me. The Lord will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always there with you. No matter what difficult time you go through, he is always there. One of my favorite stories, and I forget the lady's name, but she was a missionary in the beginning of World War II, and she was caught up in um, the Japanese onslaught when the Japanese were sweeping across the Pacific and capturing all these multiple islands. And she and her husband were captured, and they were split apart, and her husband was killed by the Japanese, died in captivity. And she... Um, they were a young family. They were in their 20s. They were time, young missionary family. She then uh, was um, held in a Japanese prison camp under horrendous conditions and circumstances. And if, if you study anything about Japanese atrocities in World War II, these are not just words that I'm saying. The Japanese were guilty of horrible atrocities in World War II. And they, uh, they, they had inflicted horrible atrocities on her. And the guards were merciless toward her. And at one point, during the lowest parts of her captivity, she um, uh, prayed, uh, and I know this sounds, it sounds funny, but she prayed for a banana. Because she, it was like she just loved bananas, and she craved it, and in her captivity, she just wanted a banana, and she prayed for a banana. No banana came. And then finally she said, I know, Lord, that was asking too much. I know that here, that's just too much for me to ask for a banana. I'm sorry. About two days later, uh, the commandant comes in and sees her in her condition, and he's mortified. The commandant, this new, new commandant comes in, and he's like treating a woman like this. They couldn't believe it. And so he, he just, without saying a word, looks at her, shakes his head, walks out. About 15 minutes later, guys start bringing in buckets of bananas into her room. And she's now got bananas all over the place in her cell, full of bananas. And she said, I never doubted the power of God again after that point. Just think about that for a moment, how unlikely that is. But that is how amazing our God is. God can reach into the depths of any dungeon that we're in, and he's there with us. He's there with us every step of the way. There's no prayer that God can't answer, and there's no, nothing that God can't do within his nature. And so we must understand that we serve an amazing God and we go through these trials and tribulations. We're going through it with the Lord, with the Lord. And um, I, think of, I think of my drill sergeants when I was in boot camp. Uh, and a couple of my drill sergeants, one of them in particular, was, the guy was just unhinged. I think he really just enjoyed inflicting misery on people. And in fact, you know, the other, a couple other drill sergeants that I had, I, I at least knew that they wanted us to be good soldiers and that they were committed and stuff. But this guy was crazy. I mean, really, I'm not making this up. This is not just exaggerated preacher talk. He was crazy. I mean, he was just really... And so he would, he would just say these things, bizarre things, and he would get up on these long-winded tangents, and you had no idea what the guy was going to say or what was going to come out of his mouth, and he was just weird. He'd be nice to you one day and then mean as anything the next day, and... It was just like really bizarre. At least the other drill sergeants were consistently mean. You know, that was cool. At least I knew where they were coming from. Um, and, but the bottom line, though, is that, is, is, I forget where I was going with that. Let me think. The drill sergeant, yeah. Uh, with this drill sergeant, as, as unhinged and as imbalanced as he was and never knowing where he was coming from, you didn't know if it was a blessing or a curse for him to be around. Some days it could be a curse and some days it could be a blessing. But with the Lord, it's always a blessing to have him around. And you know, when the Lord is putting you through this training and this difficulty, he's always there and he's always right and he's always loving and he's always overlooking us and he is always, always, always 
for us. Always. Never is he against you in terms of, one, he always wants you, he might be chastening you at times, he may be against your choices and against your decisions sometimes, but he's never against you as a person. He loves you, and he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. And so we can count it as joy because the Lord is with us. And we also can count it as joy because it says here that we can know. It doesn't say that we can believe, we can think. We can know that the testing of our faith, the testing of our faith produces patience. In other words, it produces this perseverance. And so as your faith is being tested, you can know that it's strengthening you. There's a great, great meme on Facebook. I love it. It says, what doesn't, uh, what's saying? What, what doesn't kill you uh, will make you stronger except bears, bears will kill you. That's great, you know, but, but uh, it's a great, great meme. But it says, but basically this saying is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, and that's the idea here, all right? The Lord has you in the palm of his hand. And Jesus says, no man can pluck them out of my Father's hand. We are held secure. And so no matter how much life is against us, you're not being plucked out of your Father's hand. Your Heavenly Father holds you and will never let you go, never let you go. And yet, we know that as we are hit with these trials and tribulations, we are getting stronger. No doubt, if you've, if you've been a Christian for any length of time and you've been through some trials and tribulations, you can say right now that you are stronger today in your walk with the Lord than you were several years ago, before you went through those trials and tribulations, that you are stronger today. And that's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to make you stronger. And I, one of my favorite uh, self-help speakers out there, he's passed away now, he's a Christian, he passed away, went on to be with the Lord, is Jim Rohn. And Jim Rohn used to say, don't pray that life becomes easier, pray that you become better. Pray that you become stronger. Don't just pray for, for everything to be an easy bed of roses. Pray that you're strong enough that you can handle it. Pray that you're able to take on those situations and those challenges. And you can know that as the Lord is working with you and training you and developing you, you are getting stronger. And, and it, it, they said that even self-help people who aren't necessarily Christians will say that the key to happiness, at least in the short term, is progress toward a worthy goal. If you're making progress and you can know that, then you're at least, you've got something to live for and look forward to. Well, imagine in this case, as Christians, we don't just have to rely on this general sense of progress. We can rely on the fact that we are progressing in our Christian life. Now, this gets a little bit deep and psychological here, but follow me here on this. Understand that the way the Lord has structured this whole thing may seem kind of nonsensical at times. It's like literally Jesus came, he died, rose again, ascends back up to heaven, and leaves us here on this earth. And you think about, you know, the church is his, and he left us in charge of the church. And that's comical when you think about it, you know. And I'm like, Jesus, come back. Why did you have to ascend up into heaven and put us in charge of this church thing, you know? I mean, is this really, because we can mess things up. But there's something really cool about how God has structured, has structured things, which I love. There is a tendency, whenever someone does something nice for us, we want to reciprocate in some way. We want to do something back and do something nice for them. That's just, a, it, it, it's inbred in us. Well, there is nothing we can do to reciprocate God's love. Nothing. I mean, God ha has sent his son, died on the cross for our sins. Nothing we can do will ever reciprocate that. Nothing. But, but, God does take joy and pleasure in using us. And as we allow God to use us, and as we draw closer to him in using us, while we can never reciprocate fully, the love that he gave us. By letting him use us and strengthen us and letting us get closer to him, we get the fulfillment that we need. The fulfillment that we need because of what he did for us. If we do not allow God to use us and we allow ourselves to drift apart from God more and more, we become miserable. We as Christians become miserable because we as Christians have this we have this psychological and emotional need to want to please our Savior. We want to do things good for our Savior because he did so much for us. But if we instead surrender ourselves to pleasure and vanity and all the things that are empty in life and we don't live for him, then we become the most miserable people on this earth. I believe that a Christian out of God's will is the most miserable person on this earth because we have that relationship and we know God is real and we know what he has for us and we allow ourselves to be isolated from him, 
we become most empty of anyone. Truly empty. The Lord wants to fill us up. He doesn't want us to go through life empty. And here, in this promise that I find to be so beautiful at the end, if we will allow the Lord to have his perfect work in us, to give us that endurance, to really do that perfect and complete work in us, the, this promise is that we will be then perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That fulfillment that we need, that relationship that we need, will be there for us, and we won't lack for anything, and we'll be complete. We will be full. Think about going and eating at a feast, at a buffet. You ever eaten at a buffet before? Now, I love, as I've mentioned a few times, I love all-you-can-eat buffets, especially seafood buffets, especially when those seafood buffets have crab legs on them, okay? Um, and I'm going to be very disappointed if crab legs are not in heaven. I'm just going to say right now, okay? So I also like scallops. Uh, and the broiled scallops are really good. Um, and so going into an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet and eating crab legs, just sitting down with a big plate of crab legs. Do you all remember Chesapeake Bay Seafood House? Remember that? Okay. All right. You remember... Uh, I have great fond memories of that place, and I would go, and I had a good buddy of mine, and we would go, we'd eat there, we would just keep them crab leg plates coming. I mean, sometimes eight, nine plates of crab legs just coming. And, uh, and there was one particular time that we ate, and we ate, and we ate, and we grazed, and sheep do, you know, we grazed, and we ate, and, and we were like beached whales at the end of that. I mean, we were stuffed full. We lacked for nothing food-wise at that point. You had to get a wheelbarrow to get us out of the restaurant, okay, at that point. But this is what, what James is kind of getting at here. If we will let the Lord, let the Lord do the work that he wants to do with us. If we will let that work commence, let that work happen, we will be full and satisfied. And we will lack nothing. That's the promise. And then when we do that, when we do that, we can truly cross the finish line with our torch still lit. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. I thank you for how wonderful and how awesome you are. I thank you for how much you love us, how much you care for us. I thank you that no matter what difficult times we go through in this life, that you're there with us the whole, the whole time. I thank you that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I thank you that because of that strength that you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ, and through the Holy Spirit, that we can endure these difficulties and we can develop the strength and the endurance and the perseverance that you want us to have in our Christian faith. When we go through difficult times, even though they are difficult, and even though we should weep with those who weep, nevertheless, Father, I pray that we will always be mindful to esteem it as joy, to count it as joy, that you trust us enough to send us through those tests and difficulties and to know that you're with us the whole way. Lord, may we be truly the kinds of Christians that you would have us to be, perfect and complete and lacking nothing, as it says in this passage, this precious and wonderful passage from James. Now, Father, I commit this time of invitation to your honor and glory alone. May you move in our hearts. If anyone here needs to make a decision in prayer, Lord, this time of reflections for them. If anyone wishes to make a public decision before their brothers and sisters in Christ, either for baptism or salvation or church membership or just giving up something to you, whatever the case may be, this invitation is for them as well. We give it to you, totally to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'll please stand.